round of applause, Tim Schaefer. Thank you. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks everyone for sticking around to this, the very last uh, talk. I don't know why I have the honor of going last, except for I know Andy knows I'm a Breaking Bad fan, so I won't go long. <laughs> Joke's on you, I have TiVo. It's totally taken care of. Um, but first, this is, this is the last talk, I think. It's been such a great, great conference being here with all of you and seeing all these, this crazy collection of people um, and seeing it so well organized and curated. I just wanted to have one big thanks and round of applause for both Andy's over here. Great job. Amazing talk. So um, it's, been, it's been so great to hear all these stories of just crazy, magical, good and bad things happening to people because they make connections with technology and the internet and I was just so full of inspiration and um, to be honest, like my New Year's resolution this year was every time I'm tempted to use the word envious or jealous, I, if you just say inspired instead, it just makes you sound like a better person. It's like <laughs> when you're at your friend's house and they have a, two bathrooms in their house and you only have one, you're like, oh, your house is so inspiring. <laughs> um, it's just a tip if you want to hide the darkness. With it. Anyway, <laughs> so, so a lot of these great stories have been so fun to listen to and people going to college and then tumbling out of college and starting a company and selling it for a billion, zillion dollars are just very inspiring to me. Um, and I, I hope, uh, I strive to have a story that fills you with that same inspiration. Um, <laughs> that um, kind of weird magic connected moment for me happened not at the beginning of our career, I, though I was pretty lucky in the beginning of my career. It happened kind of at the middle or like at the end of my career, depending on how this talk goes. But like, <laughs> and I'm going to just back it up a little bit and tell that story. Uh, as quick as I can so you guys can all either watch Breaking Bad or go play with the baby goats in the field, depending on what type of a person you are. So um, just to start with something broad that everyone can enjoy, adventure games, right? <laughs> I was thinking about this a lot when uh, Jonathan was talking because it's just, we hear the word niche more than anyone, like niche, niche, we're making a niche game. But I love these uh, games. When I was growing up, Voodoo Castle was one of the first, Zork. There were, um, these games that promised that you get just dropped into this world where you could just do anything, anything you want. You could just type it in, you know, just explode or jump up and it just, it seems so, like so much potential um, to just do anything you want. Here's what they actually look like. Um, this was the fancy version, the ones I played only had text and you could just type, pick up steak, knife, you know, I mean, steak Dracula. And um, they were just such a great way that I spent a, a lot of my uh, childhood was playing these games. Um, and, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life all the way through college. I was studying computer science and also creative writing, and I wanted to, I thought I'd be a, a writer who had some database programming job on the, on the side um, to pay for that. And then um, I stumbled on this, this job listing. So this is the only copy of the job listing I could find that I, during the phone interview, just scribbled on incessantly. <laughs> Dragon scales are very relaxing to draw when you're nervous. And um, this phone interview that I totally blew, and then somehow got this job, because Lucasfilm Games was looking for uh, programmers who could write dialogue or dialogue or writers who could program or vice versa because in these games when you talk to the shopkeeper he needs to know like he needs to say something different to you based on you know whether you already saw the pirate ship or whether you don't have the sword yet or you need all these sometimes change this logic all around but still have it sound good um, and they needed that kind of a specific combination of skills uh, and so I lucked into that job and the second lucky thing was the first thing I got to work on was the secret of monkey island which is um, thank you Um, Ron Gilbert's uh, pirate uh, opera, and um, I was called, uh, my job description was scumlet, so it was a very auspicious beginning. And for those of you who don't know how to play these games, you just you, you click on a verb, you can use the pirates, you can pick up the rubber chicken with the pulley in the middle and use it on the rat, and um, magic ensues after that. And um, the fun thing about these games is that you get to write the response to that, like what happens when you use the rubber chicken with the pulley in the middle on the, on the rat. And, I don't even remember what happens, but the fun was like not coming up with the obvious ones that solved the puzzles. Not that the puzzles were obvious, they're really obscure, but um, using some random object with some thing in the world that doesn't even make sense, but thinking that somebody somewhere is gonna think this is the solution to a puzzle, 
And why might they think that? What kind of person would that be? And then putting in a joke like response that that one person will hear, like that one person playing the game might get that response. And, and in that moment, think that someone out there thinks like I do in that moment. They, like, they knew what I was thinking. And that's just so rewarding to write that line that will make someone feel that somebody else feels like they do and thinks like they do for a little bit. And that it's this, like this way of letting someone know they aren't alone in the world, which is, or perpetuates the myth that they aren't alone in the world, depending on how you, <laughs> you view that thing to make life bearable. But I mean, like, it's one of the most, uh, to me, like the most valuable thing about art is that making that connection between two people and forming that view or illusion. Um, and then I got to work on uh, the sequel to that, more monkeys and more pirates, and uh, we did a game called Day of the Tentacle, which was just because we loved Chuck, thank you. Um, we loved just Chuck Jones cartoons, like Duck and Muck, and we wanted to make a game that looked like a Chuck Jones cartoon, and we even tricked Chuck Jones to come to town and stay in a hotel and look at the game, because our marketing department wanted to have him say something that we could put on the box, and um, they, they never told him that, they just kind of hung around with him and showed him the game and waited for him to say something, but all he said is, why did you bring me here? <laughs> um, and then because I love like, um, just sharing my food, like Yojimbo and Road Warrior, I made this, and Hell's Angels by Hunter Thompson, made this game about being the leader of a biker gang, roughly based on my life, full throttle. And, thank you. And you can see here that uh, this is how you talk to people. It's a very uh, complex and rich dialogue system. Um, and then uh, the, the last adventure game I made at LucasArts was called Grim Fandango. It's because I loved, I loved, um, thanks. I loved, um, I was studying Mexican folklore in college about the day of the dead and the four year journey of the soul and it all sounded like such a great epic adventure. And I was also really into film noir movies and so combined those together to make something that was, looked nothing like the slide, which I realized has no Mexican folklore or film noir elements really. I also like Big Daddy Roth. So I mean, it all kind of you know, made sense I think if you were there at the time. But we made this game. And it was awesome, when won Game of the Year on GameSpot, and it was really fun. Um, but by the time I left um, LucasArts, it, was, it had sold about like 500,000 copies, which was seen as, this, in the company it kind of met its numbers, but it seemed like this, it, it was, the lore of it was like this huge flop, and it was kind of described as the last adventure game because uh, people I knew at other companies were trying to get adventure games made, and they're like, well, Grim Fandango didn't sell anything, so you can't make your game here. So it was like this blunt instrument that I created to kill the genre. Um, and it was really starting this, started this frustration with me of like, if you can find 500,000 people who like the thing that you're making, like, that should be enough. Like, you should be able to make a living off of 500,000 people, for crying out loud. Um, and so I did that, just planted that seed in my head. Um, and so I started, I left uh, uh, LucasArts um, to start my own company in the year 2000. It sounds so fantastic when you say it that way. Um, <laughs> Because part of it was that I wanted to control these characters, you know, that I made these games under the employment of George Lucas, so he owned them. And now um, um, Disney owns them, which I'm sure they're going to take really good care of them. And um, that's fine. I don't have, not bitter. So um, it was a fair deal. They paid me. And so I was like, the only way I'm going to get control of my own characters is to uh, start my own company. And so we did. And also I wanted to, it was like, I wanted to have a company, like every company kind of gets, you really only get one uh, top thing that like you say this is the thing that we're about more than anything else and for us We want to start a company that's about creativity because you can put technology first or a lot of different things first And they're all I think equally valid and ours was going to be creativity and it hopefully still is um, But I was really I was really scared to start companies and a lot of people in this room have started companies and so they probably They're like what's the big deal, but I mean like um, You'll probably remember it just seems impossible before when you're working at a company and you're like oh, I don't how how does that in the same way that when I was a kid, I used to think about video games like, oh, they're made by people much, much smarter than me, like whole big organizations of people in lab coats, and they're made by robots assemble them or something. Like, it seemed like I just was not qualified to do this and definitely not qualified to start my own company. And like, I didn't really want to, the two big hangups I had, I remember toilet paper and copy paper. Like, I was like, I don't want to worry about where the toilet paper for the bathroom comes from and how we get copy machine paper. Like, I, I just want to make games. Like, that was, a, I don't, it's embarrassing to say now that one, these are the two main reasons I never started my own company. <laughs> And so um, other people were leaving LucasArts at the time, and they were starting their own companies, and I was like, okay, that guy, I don't want to say he's dumber than me, but he's not much smarter than me. He's like just a, like a little bit smarter than me, and if he can do it, I'm sure I could do it. So um, a lot of the themes of the stuff that I've been trying to do later on that I'll get to have to do with exposing my own self as someone definitely, definitely not any smarter than anyone. And like, 
if definitely if we can do it, so can you. So, um, so I quit, and uh, and um, and it was like it was like this veil was lifted. You know, after we started our own company, like they looked me, looking behind the curtain at the world, all of a sudden, you know, I realized that I had been looking at a lot of things as opportunities that, if I worked hard, would be kind of handed to me. Like if I do really good at this job, my boss will give me a raise, or I'll, if I do well at this interview, I'll get this job, or if I do well in school, I'll get a good grade. And like, what you know, as long as I do well, the, these opportunities will be handed to me. And then you realize, once you do something, you start a company, you're like, oh, it's not, it's not. That only took really half an hour with that lawyer to do that. And like, I wonder. Um, you start to see things as like, there are all these opportunities that you can make for yourselves, and the, and, and the world kind of changed for me, and I realized that they're just out there for the, you know, for the taking, if you will. And you, a lot of people in this room have done that same thing, so I don't want to go over that, but um, you've had that same feeling, which is crazy. Um, and this is Double Fine, and they're um, friends and family and dogs and children. Um, and, and it's been great, and it's been a company that we've been um, dedicated to that, that, that that value, that creativity was our main thing. And we happily, for the first 10 years of our existence, I mean, not happily all the time, but like we, we did definitely make, uh, you know, we made one game after another, and that's exactly how many we made. We made one game and then another for 10 years. It took us 10 years to make those games. Um, this was about a boy who can go inside of people's minds, and this one was because I love heavy metal and I want to make a game about heavy metal. Um, so we made those two games, but we made them in the um, traditional publishing model of games. And I don't know if you guys are in the games industry, but the games industry is, is horrible. It's horrible, it's a horrible thing. Um, no, I mean, wait, the people are great. The deals are terrible. The, the publishing deals, like, and they're very similar to in music and, and movies where you have this, you know, um, this, this deal where you get an advance against royalties, and then you have to, if your money, game makes money, you pay them back, and then you get a cut. Except for you don't have to pay them back once, you have to pay them back about three or four times before you get a cut, and so you end up spending all the money they gave you, and then you have no money, and then you have to fire everybody, or you have to take the next horrible deal which comes along, and then you're in this constant cycle of like really never like owing your soul to the company store and never getting free of this, um, always going out of business almost, unless you have a, you're lucky enough to be the Rolling Stones, really, of games. Like, they have a really big hit, and then you can, make four or five times your money, and then you get a little cut of that. Um, so it's frustrating. But we did it anyway, because we loved these games, and the whole goal was just to be able to do what we loved, and that was, um, that was uh, enough for a while. But it was, it was very um, stressful for the team, obviously, to almost go out of money. It was like swinging through the jungle, vine to vine, and we always hope we can grab the next vine before this vine is out, but we're always just having to let go and just hope we find a vine before we hit the ground. Um, so we're always thinking, like, there's got to be a better way to doing this thing. And also, our company was um, kind of bulging at the seams. Uh, not, not just actually size-wise, but skill-wise. Like, we had me, all the games up to that point had been my idea, like, I want to make this game. So I'd have an art director and a lead programmer and a lead designer and so on. And so the whole company only had one art director, one lead programmer, and it's like, as people started to become senior, you know, in their 10 years, like, I think I want to move up. And the only way they could move up is someone got fired or if I got killed. So I was like, <laughs> this is an uncomfortable position to be in. Um, People were looking at me funny. And um, so I, uh, we started thinking about a, a new way to, to, to do things. I was really inspired by, um, so Paul Newman, I'm always really inspired by Paul Newman because he made a lot of money being a, um, a movie star and he, and he, and he could have given, just given all that money to charity and it would have been a great thing but he made instead salad dressing and he made a whole company that makes salad dressing and a whole bunch of other food products and they give all their money to charity and this has always been this crazy idea to me that he made instead of one donation he made this machine that like makes donations and he's passed away and he's dead and this machine is still making money for the causes he cares about and how badass is that? I mean that's crazy. So um, not that I was going to do something that philanthropic you know uh, but <laughs> You know, maybe there's a way instead of just making this one thing after another, I can create this machine that will make um, the, like a perpetual creativity machine that will keep generating ideas and protecting them and, and nurturing them to the point where they can be um, released to people. Um, and here's that one idea being made and then the salad dressing. It was really late at night when I made these slides. So, um, <sighs> instead of making salad dressing, making games, or making both games and salad dressing, who knows. Um, so we tried this thing called Amnesia Fortnite, and it's called, it's, a, it's our internal game jam that we use. Um, uh, it's called Amnesia because we just forget what we're working on, and it's called Fortnite for, I forget why. It, it takes about two weeks. Um, <laughs> thanks, thank you. Um, 
<laughs> it takes about, uh, we take two weeks off from whatever we're working on. We split the company and there's like 60 people and we used to make this big, you know, brutal legend of this huge game. Let's take a pause from that and we'll make uh, five teams and you all have to make a game in two weeks, go. And um, it was great because all of a sudden we had five project leaders and five art directors and everybody got to try to, you know, everyone got to move up and try a new role and we found out that so many people at the company had crazy uh, creative ideas and, and 3D modelers got to try concept art and programmers got to try design and it was, this, everyone was so happy for two weeks. Um, I mean, they're, I hope they're happy after that two weeks, but I mean, it was a really big boost in morale and it didn't just boost our morale, but it, it, um, it led to all the games we made in the next few years. Like all these games came out of the Amnesia Fortnite process. We had a guy who like, our lead artist made a game about well, every character is a Russian nesting doll and, and Tasha loves Halloween and role-playing games, so she made a role-playing game set on Halloween and, um, and um, Brad loves trenches, so there's this walking World War I trench game and uh, middle manager of Justice from our superhero fan at the office. Thanks, it's just a good title. And then, um, we could, because we weren't just doing one game at once, we could try experimental things like let's work with, maybe can we make, we only want to do licenses, but we really had a soft spot for Sesame Street, so we did this uh, Sesame Street game, which was great because I got to meet Cookie Monster, so that's pretty much mission accomplished there. I got to eat that cookie, and Cookie's Monster's cookies are not delicious. <laughs> I don't even think they're food. They were like um, Carpenter's glue, and those aren't chocolate chips. So, um, <laughs> And so that's been an awesome, uh, awesome change for our company. And um, we, this next, this last year, we wanted to try to do something a little different and let the public in. We wanted to do the same Indonesia Fortnite process, but instead of me picking which games were made, we, um, we posted all 26 game pitches. Anyone in the company could pitch a game, and then the internet got to vote on which games we made, and they picked the top five games, and we made them. And it seemed crazy, um, and it seemed like, you know, why were we, at first it seemed like we can't let the public pick what game we work, that's just too big of a risk, but it seemed like a, an idea that we were ready for because of this crazy thing that happened uh, the year before we did this. So back it up one year. Um, there's the box that we keep having to Fortnite in. Um, so this crazy thing that happened the year previous on Kickstarter, and I know what you're all asking, what's Kickstarter? <laughs> um, so let me explain the model to you. Um, no, that's the question I asked even a year before that when um, young Andy Bio mailed me with the help of Brandon Boyer, put, put him in contact with me and said, hey, you guys ever think about doing a Kickstarter project? And I said, what's Kickstarter? I had not heard of it. Um, this is like 86. I don't know, it was a long time ago. It was a <laughs> perfectly good excuse for me not to know what it was. So I mailed our, our um, head of biz dev. And he said, oh, it's a crowdfunding model. I've seen it work for small games, like 50K, but it's completely impractical for something of the scale. So we didn't do it. And we just said, ah, forget it, and forgot all about it. Um, and that guy's not at the company anymore. So we, um, <laughs> fear. Anyway, and then we were contacted by um, this uh, group of uh, young lads from Portland called Two Player Productions. And they had made a crowdfunded documentary about Minecraft, about Mojang, the company that made it. And they had interviewed me for it. And they're like, hey, for our next project, we're thinking we could do a documentary about you guys. And I was like, that's fucking awesome because I like attention. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like the idea for a lot of different reasons, but they, um, they said, we could, let's kickstart it. And so we're like, that sounds good because I, I mean, the two things that I really wanted to do, besides getting a whole bunch of attention, the other two things were uh, I wanted to answer that, that problem of like when I was a kid, I didn't understand that it was just people like me who made games, that I could do it too. So if we make a documentary that shows us bozos around the office kind of like knocking rocks together and making a game, it, people would be like, oh, I can do that. And then the other thing is also conversely show how hard it is because we also get comments a lot of the times like, I don't understand why you didn't add multiplayer, just flip that switch on, it'll work. And like, <laughs> I also wanted to show how hard it is to make games or how hard it is to make anything and how a lot of the times people just assume these things are our choices when really just like when you're making a game, you're just like holding onto this crazy tornado and like, oh, thank God we survived that. And um, anyway, uh, and so I wanted, I wanted to be definitely a part of this documentary. And, um, and I started thinking about how, well, I really want to show everything. I really want to show the, um, the ugly parts of game development, like the fights or the, the conflicts and the trade-offs and the, the weird things that happen, the part, the part of your game where you're like, um, 
ironically, behind schedule, or like having to cut a lot of things out of your game or choose between two tough trade-offs. And I thought if we had a publisher, you know, publishers are very, and I'm not saying that publishers are bad or anything, because um, that doesn't need to be said, but I, um, <laughs> they, they're, you know, they're, they have a certain model of PR which you can't, I mean, they, they just wouldn't approve anything. Like if I really had something that made it look like we cut something out of the game, they'd be like, well, that makes the game look worse, and so you can't show that in the documentary. I just foresaw this all happening in my head, and I wanted to show everything. And um, so, like, we said, let's make a, um, a little game too, just part of the Kickstarter, as like an offshoot on the Kickstarter, um, so that we can be totally free to show whatever we want, and we'll be the only ones in control of it. So this is actually the number for the, they said, well, it cost about $100,000 to make the last documentary, so we'll ask for that for the documentary, and I wanted $400,000 to make the game. <coughs> and I, um, I don't know where I got that number, but I was like, everyone was like, that's too much, to, that, we can't ask for that on Kickstarter, they'll, we'll, they'll kill us. Um, so we, we cut it down to $300,000. That was what we asked for in our, in our Kickstarter thing. And it was really nerve-wracking, and I was like, I remember posting it the first night, like, I just, if we could just make $2,000, I'd be so, so happy. And this was 2012. So, um, and also, I started thinking about, back up a little bit, what, what kind of game should this be? Because we can't just say, hey, we want to make a game, fund it. Um, I started thinking about the this, this story. Like, I'm a, I'm a writer, so I think of everything in terms of, like, narrative solutions. So, like, this has got to be really a good story. And I started thinking back to those adventure games, the games that everyone said were too niche and the, they didn't have a big market. And um, it, wouldn't it be great to make one of those? Because I do get, we get approached, just like we showed in our, in our pitch video. There's a scene from the exciting Kickstarter pitch video that we made. Um, uh, modeling something that happens a lot over email. Someone would mail me and say, I, why don't you go back to, why don't you make an adventure game again? I really like those games. And I would say, oh, you know, you can't get those funded anymore. Publishers won't go for it. And they said, but I'd buy one. I'd buy one. And like a few people would tell me that. And it's like, well, that's okay. That's $35 we got right there. So we just need the next $35 and the next $35. Surely there's no way that you can actually, there's no, nothing, there's no you know, place where this can actually be made to happen. But um, it seemed like, oh my god, Kickstarter, that's exactly what it is. A bunch of people are like, I got $35. I want, it. I want an adventure game. And it organized all those people, and it, and it totally made it happen. And so we were super surprised when we made 3.3. Uh, it went up at, uh, with the, the kind of other donations we got around $3.4 um, million dollars to make this game. And it was crazy, as you can see. Even my daughter was skeptical. <laughs> She's like, no way. I thought 1.5 at most. <laughs> um, and it was crazy. I mean, it was just, there was nothing like the excitement of this. Uh, you know, we were, you know, we, we ended up breaking a bunch of records at the time, and, and just the party was just crazy, and just, just the moment we hit a million was just so exciting. And, and um, of course, I'll show you a chart that I stole off the web, because uh, you gotta have one of these in there, but it showed that it was a lot different than what had been going on before in gains projects. Um, I can't read the numbers from here, but that, that one green bar is really big. Much bigger than the other green bars. <laughs> <coughs> That's why I have to have a biz dev guy. Cause so so it, was a lot, it was a great thing to happen on a lot of different levels. Just for me, personally, I mean, it had been really like, you know, those 10 years had been kind of a, at times a tough slog and very stressful and like, what, it was kind of a what's it all about kind of year. Like, what are we doing this for? It's like, I almost go to business after every game. It's crazy. And um, in the same way, at the end of uh, It's a Wonderful Life, you know, George Bailey's like, wants to end it all. Not that I was you know, on a bridge or anything, but I, um, the whole town, you know, he, here's, he needs money, and they come to his aid, and they dump all the money, and the money, the money does solve his problem, but it's really finding out that the whole town cares about him, that is really the part of the movie, we get all choked up, and you're like, oh, that's amazing, that's so great, you know, and um, so that was great for me, but it also was amazing for the whole team, even people who weren't even going to be working on this adventure game, they just, the whole company just felt this wave of love coming towards the, the, coming from the internet, it was just like all this, like, we love you, double fine, like, people were just screaming that at us, and it made everyone so excited. Um, but it wasn't just about us, it was about what the fans were excited about. Here's a fan, right here, who's made a lovely Raz doll. Um, and they were, what they were talking about, they would make these YouTube videos talking about how this is our moment to like show that we're not pirates. You know, you put these publishers, put these horrible DRMs in our game and you treat us bad. And this is us saying that we'll pay for something that we don't even have to pay for if you just treat us well, if you just treat us with little respect and, and, and give us what we want. Um, and seeing how empowered it made them feel um, 
it just it was on so many levels just the, the best thing uh, that happened. Um, and it also started this um, this thing, uh, this culture of openness, this change in our company. Because I had come from here, from the ranch. This is where, when I was making those Monkey Island games, um, or working on them, I was up at Skywalker Ranch. There's a picture of Skywalker Ranch. And there are not that many of them, because you see, I'm in it, not just because I want you guys to all look at a picture of me, but because um, the rule of Skywalker Ranch is if you take a picture at the ranch, or one of your guests takes a picture, you have to be in it. So if they ever find it on the internet somewhere, they know which employee to fire. So like, <laughs> it's very secretive, and that's totally, uh, they're right, because a lot of crazy people want to steal the next Star Wars script, you know. So um, I kind of like had that mentality. Everything was super secret, and we we're always, you know, protecting all of our, our secrets. And like letting someone see concept art for a game that's not done would have been kind of crazy, because what if that character got cut, which happens all the time? Or what if we changed the concept art, and someone's like, I like the old concept art better. That would it seem like this really big deal. And uh, in the making of this documentary, I just learned that that's, that's not a big deal at all. And the, and um, the surprising thing was that the more we exposed, the more vulnerable we were to our fans, the more, instead of judging us, the more bought in they were, and the more they felt like they were part of it too. And it was just, um, it was just great. And it was like throwing, um, it felt like we were throwing open the gates of the chocolate factory and letting everyone come in and see the Oompa Loompas, who I guess was us. Um, <laughs> where the chocolate factory was all locked for years, and then we threw the doors open. Um, and, and it's just been incredibly rewarding to do this thing called the Double Fun Adventure uh, and make this game. So that was last year, and the game's coming along. It's this crazy story about this girl who's been chosen to be a sacrifice for her town. Meanwhile, this boy is a lost and alone on a spaceship, and um, it's this kind of coming of age story. And, and you can tell, like, my pitch is not as uh, slick as it usually is because I didn't have to go to like 20 different publishers and pitch this in a meeting room. It's just to get to just make it, which is crazy. But it's um, a game that we're really proud of and um, excited to see it come together. And it really is an old fashioned adventure game where you point and click and you walk around and you drag rubber chickens onto people. And there's no rubber chicken, but um, stuff like that happens. And um, what it's done is kind of awoken that old, um, it woken that old adventure game maker in me of like, oh, I think I remember how to make these. And I want to make it like this. And I had very ambitious plans for it. And um, at a certain point, I realized that these plans were actually even bigger than the $3.4 million we got from Kickstarter. The, that mon the amount of money that seemed like a huge, like, oh my god, that's crazy. It's like, actually, we want to make an even bigger game. And so we talked about what we can do about that. And another thing that had happened at our company is that we, uh, through another connection, a crazy connection on Twitter, met this. Um, this man, Stephen Dengler, who's like a big fan and wanted to fund ports of our games. with an angel investor. We met an, met an angel investor on Twitter. And, um, and doing those ports and self-publishing them, and actually we got to do this thing we had not never done before, which is make money. We had, made, had our own money for a while. And they're like, that's crazy. Um, and we made the decision to spend, our, spend this money to expand Broken Age and what it could be. And um, it was kind of it, like, can we make it? We, I think we can just barely make it, but what if we release the first part of the game first on Steam Early Access and use that money to fund, and just make sure we have enough to, to cover the rest of it. And it seemed like, okay, that's a, that's not the, that's a change, and what are the backers going to think about that? Do we really want to do it? And it seemed like the best way to make a game as the scope and the complexity that I felt like these fans of adventure games would really want. And even doing so, I had to cut the game way down just to fit into there. Um, and so we wrote this all up, and we explained the whole thought process to all of our backers on our forums. We have like a private backer forums for them. And um, we explained it, and we were like, I hope they, they take it well. So this is like, whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> let's start with the good news. So um, like the very first thing our backers say is like, sounds great. And the next one is, sounds okay to me, chief. This is going to be funny later when people call me different things. Um, <laughs> Sounds like a plan, sounds like a good idea to get some money to finish the game. Go for it, guys, any way you can, peace. Um, and we learned a lot from this experience, which is that talking to your, your fans and your backers is different than talking to everybody. Because um, they've been there with us from the beginning, they've been watching all these documentary episodes, we're showing our thought process, and <laughs> these people who are definitely on your side. And what happened was that message, um, we were eventually later gonna tell in a public press release what the new release date for the game was. Um, but it got out from our, our backer forums. It was put up on, um, on a website. And it just, it triggered this thing that I was not ready for, which was this big, big backlash from, from, from mostly non-backers. Here's, if Double Fan can't deliver an adventure game for $3 million, they should 
The fans truly gave him. They should shut their fucking doors. Tim Schafer asked for more money apart from the $3 million already received from Kickstarter to finish the game. My old days, that was called a scam. I, in my old days, that was called game development. But <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one day, too, I'll scam people out of $3.3 million and blow it on hookers like my hero, Tim Schafer. I mean, at least he's looking up to me. I mean, at least he's like, <laughs> right? Tim Schafer is the Alan Moore of video games. I love the things he makes, but I also kind of want him to get beat up for being such a douche. This guy right here, calling me a douche. <laughs> Hand ham faced guy is calling me. So um, this, is, this is crazy. And this is, um, I'm laughing about it now, but anyone who's gotten these kind of, and these are like nothing compared to what like, like any Sarkeesian or any, you know, basically any public facing woman on the internet gets. Like, but they were new to me, and I was like, ow, that's really, that's not really, really very nice. And, um, and also, that anger was also really, really mysterious to me. Like, why? Why are they so angry? Because I never, wasn't actively trying to hurt anyone. I was just trying to make this game. And this last one, so Tim Schafer can't get a game made with three million, fuck off. And people don't get why I hate Kickstarter. And that was like this clue to me that was like, it didn't occur to me there's people who hate Kickstarter. And it, because for the last year, a Kickstarter was like the best thing that ever happened to me, and it still, it still is. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it, it, it never occurred to me that like, uh, there's people really, really mad out there about Kickstarter and about crowdfunding and about people, they're just really, really inspired, right? <laughs> um, and I was you know, trying to understand that and I, I, you know, I think it, it must be really frustrating for them to um, watch, like, they, like watching me get this something for nothing. They feel like, oh, he's getting all that money for free and he's blowing it on coke and hookers, which is weird. And then. Um, and they're mad about that. The only you know, explanation I can come up with is that a lot of people really just misunderstand what Kickstarter is. And they see it as maybe it's just a business transaction, or that you're gathering investors, which is wrong, or that you're just trading a product, which is wrong. They don't see it as like patronizing of the arts. That there's someone creative who wants to make something, and you want to help them make it, and there's rewards for that. But the best reward is being part of it. Um, and I just hope that eventually people do figure that out, or else the really angry people find something really else to get angry about. Um, uh, like, like when, I remember when Pulp Fiction came out, like I was just, everyone loved it so much, I just had to hate it. I was like, oh, why do you like that movie so much? And I, I guess that's what it is. They just don't like Pulp Fiction. I don't know, so it took me years to like watch that movie and actually enjoy it because I did realize I was really just holding it against it, how everyone loved that movie. That's a weird thing about people. Anyway. <laughs> So, the, and it wasn't just the kind of um, crazy people on Twitter, it was like, um, and I'm not dismissing uh, the fact that we had, you know, that we were shipping a later date, we were slipping the project out, and we weren't, you know, I'm not saying that that was nothing, you know, and there were definitely, our own backers had questions about it, but they were, they were asking it in terms of like, is this the right move for the project, not, you know, I want someone to beat you up. Um, uh, but what was really strange is also to read um, articles about it. Like there'd be articles, the headlines would be like, Double Fine out of money. That was one of the headlines. And um, somehow Double Fine needs more money to make this game. And um, for a lot of people, this is the first time they'd ever heard about this since our original Kickstarter got a lot of news, you know, a year before. So they were like, what? And um, well, the interesting thing was for the first time in the history of like the internet for me, the articles, the, the only, like the nice parts to read about them were the comment section which is just total reversal of all internet logic, right? Because the, the comments of them came from our backers. Uh, the, um, here they are at a fan meetup at, um, at a trade show. Um, a lovely bunch of people, the, the backers came to the rescue and they, they'd fill the comment section with like, they're not actually out of money, what they're doing is this. And it was like, this is so amazing to see this little cavalry of all these fans come to our aid and um, be on forums, you know, and, 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 and kind of help changed any of the misinformation that got out there about what we were doing. So all this like openness and love that we had been feeling towards our fans was, was rewarded and it was great. Some cosplay, it's lovely to see, isn't it? Anyway, um, and during that time there was, there was some um, actual costs associated with it. We, had to, we said we'd give refunds to anyone, so we actually had a, we lost about 600 bucks. <laughs> 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 it was money. I did not. I did not put that up there to get last. But hey, we did it. We did offer reward uh, uh, refund to anybody who wanted it. And in that same period of time, we actually made about four thousand dollars. So it was, in the end, 
um, we're going to just ship again, slip the schedule again, because we make money every time we do it. <laughs> you can see I've learned my lesson. <laughs> um, and then I have to end on this slide, because after that nasty Twitter slide that was up for so long, I have to show people hugging me, which is one of the amazing things about um, making a, having this connection, people dressing as characters from our games. There is one where I'm punching a guy, but that's just, that happens. Um, and then that, that picture where I met Rob Halford, because I want you all to know that I met Rob Halford. Um, it's, just, it's just been this amazing experience, not just the original Kickstarter experience, but then that whole roller coaster of, of our, our public-facing uh, warts and all kind of approach, which is, it seemed like it had a real downside to it, but in the end, I think it'll have a great upside um, uh, uh, and, and the takeaways from this are, the, are similar to a lot of the takeaways from a lot of the other talks, which is about you know bigger, better openness leading to better connections and and um, about the gatekeepers. You know, I just kind of over, went over that story about how we don't have to be beholden to any publishers anymore. The only people we're making our games for are the backers who paid for them, and that's who we wanted to make them for in the first place. And just all these things that um, a lot of these stories will tell you about the going around the gates and all that stuff, which is all completely true and really exciting for us. Um, but uh, the one thing that, it, that I felt out of my own experience with this was that that thing that I mentioned about um, how to be a kid playing a game and you'd write this one line of dialogue that they would find and they'd find that they weren't alone anymore, that that's a two-way street. That's my main takeaway for that, that the fans can make us feel that same way. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you for backing. Thank you for playing. And thank you for uh, putting on this awesome conference, you guys.